Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Broom, and we've been talking... (laughs) Yes, there is much rejoicing. We missed Brian while he was gone on his honeymoon. I, We've I'm been sorry talking to say about... that it, I did not miss you guys as much. <laughs> oh, I'm glad you yes, shouldn't you have. Shouldn't. <laughs> but we've been talking about Gideon and his uh, role in history and his legacy. And we came to the story of Jotham and the story that he told of the trees and the bramble. Um, and so we're going to take this opportunity to discuss why we think Christians should read fantasy. Because this is kind of a fantasy story. Trees, newsflash, don't talk. Mm. Um, Someone told They Tolkien. don't have politics. Mm. But, it's, but it's, this says, story it is in the Bible. Do. Yes, the Bible <laughs> says they have politics. See, it's right. Yeah. <laughs> but so how, how do we square this? How do we say um, whatsoever things are true and right and honorable, why should we read things that describe things that aren't the way the world is? Is that a sufficiently unclear question? Well, I've been asked it before, I imagine. I don't know, have you, have you two ever run into that? Why? Not particularly, why? actually. <laughs> I, think, I have a, a little bit. Maybe, um, maybe it's the company we much. keep, or don't keep as the kids can be. The passage you're referring to, and I can never remember all the adjectives or nouns to say maybe, Says, In Philippians? Yeah. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. And I suppose that some have pointed to that and said, but this isn't true, therefore... Uh, but before we before we go with fantasy, I think we need to back up and talk a little bit about storytelling in general. Emily, what what were you saying about this uh, blog you discovered? Yeah, I, I was checking out a blog that actually drew the line at fiction in general. Um, mm-hmm. That because Philippians exhorts us to dwell on things that are true, the stories we should read should be true stories. Um, that. They should be histories. They should be narratives that tell us what really happened instead of made up stories, whether they be in a fantasy world or in this world. You know, I think we probably could make a whole podcast just addressing that assertion. In fact, we kind of already have. (laughs) We (laughs) talked about uh, should Christians read fiction? That episode was uh, recorded during the summer. And yeah, we talked about the philosophy of storytelling and of history and of fiction mm. and kind of found there wasn't a huge distinction between no, the, these things. This, first addressing the it has to be true. That limits us not, that does not limit us to histories and, and biographies. It eliminates histories and biographies mm-hmm. because we weren't there. We don't know all the qualifying circumstances. We don't know what was relevant I don't know how many biographies and histories I've read and enjoyed, only to find out later that they were seriously wrong. Mm. And it, in some cases, it took some research, going back to source documents and other sorts of things. And, and that's assuming the source documents were, in fact, accurate and, in fact, told me everything I actually needed to know. Uh, we're constantly uh, confronted with biographies that exalt the hero of the day, but then 20, 30, 40 years later, somebody writes the expose that says, and that was all lies. Mm-hmm. Imagine a biography written on uh, John F. Kennedy while he was alive. <laughs> now, write one today. They would bear not a whole lot of similarity to each other. And probably in another 40, 50 years, we can go back and, and we will have even more insight as we look back at some of what fell out of that. And as more, for instance, Soviet records and government classified records in our own country become available. To say that we will only read that which is true limits us pretty much to speaking out of our own heads about our own experience, our immediate experiences. And we can't make judgments about anything else. Well, she thought this. Did you read her mind at the time? Then you don't know what she thought. What she said, (laughs) then you better include that. She told me that she said, that's going to get old real fast. 
Uh, the simple fact is that anytime we tell much of anything, we make stuff up because we are not God. We're not omniscient and we cannot know all of the relevant details. We can't know what is relevant to even find, even if the details are available, we don't know to look for them because we're not omniscient and don't know everything that happened. But we uh, do have relative confidence. We have relative confidence to a point. Mm -hmm. But if we're going to insist on that, only that which is true, <laughs> that's a problem. Mm -hmm. and in fact, you might argue that we're shut back to scripture because mm -hmm. we know it is absolutely true and it has no mistakes. And now we're not allowed to think about anything else. No, except because <laughs> it's, yeah, we can only think about that which is true. I suppose somebody might be able to wiggle mathematics out of that, but still there are whole math theorems and approaches to math that have proved less than reliable in the long run or valid only to a point. It's got to be a pun in there someplace. <laughs> um, same thing with the sciences. Yeah. How, I, when I was a kid, we were told that the tonsils and appendixes were vestiges of evolution and therefore absolutely worthless and should be removed at the first sign of trouble. Uh, I was told that if I had a fever, I had the flu and needed antibiotics and was given them on a regular basis if I had a fever, hmm. even though today we know that they do nothing for viral infections. So I don't know what was going on there. So we we are more and more shut up to very, very little if that's what God meant when he said that which is true. Uh, I, I once wrote a line uh, as an introduction to Shakespeare's The Tempest, the narrator introducing the play said it. I don't remember at all. But I remember this. It is required of poets not that they tell us the facts, but that they tell us the truth. Mm -hmm. And I think I went on and said something. I may have done. I don't even remember. See, I'm, I'm being less than truthful because I don't remember exactly. If I didn't, I probably should have gone on and said, because they, of all people, don't claim to be telling us the facts. Mm -hmm. they, 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 they are storytellers. They're telling us fiction. They're telling us something in beautiful words and images that conveys, we hope, powerful truth. But the, what the words are describing may in fact never happen. And the Shakespeare's Tempest is certainly an example of that. And it's also an example of fantasy literature. Mm -hmm. uh, when, we, when we come to someone who writes fiction, they, they, there's this funny thing. They're labeled either in the library or in the bookstore, fiction. <laughs> it's almost like it's not a surprise to anyone that the story's made up. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's almost like yeah. they're advertising, this is a made up story. If it is a made-up story, then it certainly isn't a lie. The question then becomes, to what degree is it telling us truth about the human condition and, and about mm -hmm. God and his universe? Right. Now, the question becomes, is that legitimate? Well, it's the kind of thing that God does on a number of occasions that Jesus did with his parables. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we don't know if all of his stories were historically, if they really happened. They may have. I tend to lean toward thinking of the prodigal son and the rich man in hell and the Good Samaritan probably were real events because if they weren't, they didn't work nearly as well. But some of them are very generic mm -hmm. and maybe happened a million times in history or maybe only once or, or, or maybe they were just supposed that. Mm -hmm. uh, did, did one king really pass out talents to his servants and one of them really hit it on the ground? It's a truthful kind of situation. It could have happened. Does Jesus mean that it actually did? I don't know. And does it matter? Not really. What he's saying <laughs> is consistent with human nature and more to the point, it's consistent with the divine reality it's portraying. This is how God deals with men. <laughs> so it's pointing to a truth beyond itself. And, and if the other examples aren't good and clear, we come back or we will shortly come back to this, this story that Jotham tells where trees <laughs> do talk. I have two interjections. Can I jump in with those? Yeah. Um, Brian's waving his hand. I have a third <laughs> one. All That's right. my own. <laughs> um, well, I will start then with the devil's advocate question, mm -hmm. and we can come back to the others. When Jesus told the parables, there was always a point, and there's mm -hmm. always a very clear, aha, that's what he was getting at. Mm -hmm. It wasn't merely from entertainment, shall we say. Ah. So how can we derive or how do we justify deriving 
telling an entertaining story for the sake of entertainment that didn't happen, using Jesus' example of the parables. Well, it seems that we've shifted ground to entertainment is sinful unless it's morally profitable. Now, there is a sense in which that's true. Uh, everything we do should be morally profitable in a biblical sense. That is, it should glorify God and advance his kingdom. Jesus has told us to seek his kingdom, his righteousness, and all things. The question is, what does that mean if I play ball with my little girl? Do I have to be quizzing her on her catechism or her Bible verses while I'm doing that? Do I have to be pointing out, you know, this ball is just like our lives. God bounces us around. It, that's horrible. <laughs> but do I have to try to find something like that in order to validate it? Or can I say that the Bible commends children playing in the streets, commends play for children. It tells us we ought to love our children. And is not this me spending time with her and building a relationship, doing something she enjoys, whether I do or not, Bouncing balls has never been my thing. <laughs> is not this forwarding the kingdom of God as I build my relationship with her as her father and her, the one who's responsible for a Christian growth when she's a little girl? Is, is that good enough? Or do I have to tack onto that some kind of moralistic lesson in order to validate it? And we can go through the whole of the whole gamut of human life. If, if I make a meal, is it all right if it tastes good? <laughs> uh, if, it, if it's not somehow communicating biblical truth, theology, or ethics, why in the world am I, uh, I okay, maybe we can justify eating it in terms of thou shalt not kill, but <laughs> why, did, why in the world should I go and make it taste good when I don't have to, when that may distract from the very thing that I'm doing this for the glory of God, why should I enjoy it at the same time? We're running into some deep theological issues and honestly, some questions of mental health. Mm -hmm. Some people take an idea and run with it without really thinking through all the ramifications of it. And, so, and you can try and, and shoot it down one step at a time. You know, it's like Odin's eight-legged horse. You can shoot out each leg one at a time. But sometimes we'll just, we, it's better just to say, shoot the horse in the head and let's start over. <laughs> let's let, let, let's get to the point. Let's go. Let's, and, and, and here, I think, is where we should start. And my, we probably have done this before, but my memory fails me. We start with God as, as creator and a storyteller. First, God as creator. God made a beautiful world full of colors and textures and smells, odors, fragrances, patterns. Uh, an incredibly diverse, beautiful world that appeals to all of our senses. And there have been religious people who are offended at that. God invented sexuality. And you can almost hear some religious people saying, and I would have thought more of him had he not. <laughs> um, they, they cannot handle this because for them, holiness, the glory of God, the purity of God is wrapped up in some otherworldly, abstract, ethereal kind of existence that is shorn of all emotion, all imagination. But you look at the Bible in vain for any such thing. The Bible is not like that. <laughs> uh, you read through the Bible and you get all kinds of wonderful things. You also get some pretty horrible, gross things. Mm. And, God yeah, and that's what I always think when I hear the whatsoever things are true and right and lovely and honest and stuff um, used to limit reading. Yeah. Because the Bible has things in it that are not lovely. Now, the Bible overall is lovely, but the story of the rape of Tamar... No, it's not <laughs> yeah, lovely at that's all. Not, that's not lovely, no. Or it's the also other interesting. Team. Yes, Brian. It's also interesting that um, you know you get you get some people and they they sort of incidentally accidentally stumble into uh, we hope unintentional Gnosticism, yeah. where it's oh, 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 there's this. the bell, <laughs> okay. and um, basically say, well, you know, we should really only do things. You know, and it starts off with good intentions for for God's glory, which means that we only do things that are bad experiences because that is more holy, and we grow in piety. And it sort of I was reminded of that quote from 
Douglas Adams, and I kind of thought maybe they would agree with this about, you know, in the beginning, the universe was created. This has made a lot of people very angry and has been widely <laughs> regarded as a bad move. <laughs> Yeah. That I, I think I think there are some people who who would agree because before that there was nothing but spirit and nothing but God. What in the world was God thinking to create all of this this dirt and flesh and minerals and breeding and birthing and burping and eating? I mean, well, we're forgetting you, that's the demiurge's fault. So yeah, yeah. that's and, 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 and so the Greeks created the demiurge, the lesser god who did all that gross stuff. He he looked into the realm of Platonic form and. And copied it as best he could, but not being a true creator, he got an awful lot wrong and made a lot of icky stuff. And and that's kind of where we, we're, we're left, as far as the Greeks are concerned. And far too often, the church or parts thereof have copied that as a pattern for holiness. And yes, unfortunately, in our attempts to write, um, sometimes we have um, we've just gotten rid of fiction, fantasy, and all that altogether. We just want dry books on morality and how to be good, which, of course, is itself a rather hellish approach to Christianity. <laughs> um, but if we're going to admit fiction and such, we we try to churchify it and, and make it a tool for evangelism. And, you know, by, by chapter three, there needs to be a conversion story and all this kind of thing. <laughs> and in the process, we write the, the, the worst tripe possible mm -hmm. because we're not, we're not telling the truth about the human condition. The kind of stories that get written like that may have happened if we cut away a lot of what was going on all around these people at the time. But more often than not... We're not even addressing the real sin because talking about real sin itself is rather touchy and icky. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, nobody wants to, no Christian really wants to write a novel about a man dealing with pornography in his life mm -hmm. or a family dealing with incest. Mm. Yeah, okay. So my wife points out that Doug Wilson apparently has. Um, but uh, yeah, we don't like him. <laughs> yeah, we don't talk about it. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, I've heard about the book and it sounds horrible and like the last thing on earth that I want to read. Yeah, Unfortunately, kind of it falls into the same trap of just being bad writing. Yeah. I've seen excerpts. <laughs> yeah, Ugh. sometimes just being a bad writer will, will, will get you there too. So we're, we're coming back to God who creates a beautiful world, but decrees allows that there should be sin in this world which distorts the beauty without completely destroying it. So we have this world where there's beauty and there's lack of beauty. There's, there's truth and there are lies. There's love and there's hate. And he makes this the operating theater for his story. And the hero is himself, that is to say his son, who comes into this story as the hero to rescue the bride, defeat the dragon, and you know all the rest of it. I'm sure we've talked about that before. Mm -hmm. But Before the, we get... Yeah, go sorry. Ahead. Um, I was just going to make sure we went back and picked up Brian's comments um, from before. Yeah. So yeah. just the the thing I wanted to uh, bring up is that, you know, you mentioned, oh, if we're only if we're only going to stick to things that we know for a fact are true mm -hmm. and contain no shred of subjectivism, yeah. then like you said, we're, we're stuck with just the Bible. And that sounds sort of good to some people. But the problem is that now you you can't find greater assurance that the Bible is true by looking to outside verification of its historical events. You can't look at church history at all to see how people have interpreted that true scripture yourself. So what you end up with is a these are my buzzwords for the for the episode. The Biblicist fideism. Fideism. <laughs> Ooh, fideism. fideism. I don't know how to I've only ever seen it written. I've never heard anyone <laughs> say it. Um and then the other thing too is that if you're going to essentially say, okay, now we can't say anything that's that's not one hundred percent objectively, scientifically, factually true, uh, then you have to throw out the Psalms. And oh. Song of Solomon, and most prof prophetic utterances from, yeah. you know, Isaiah and Ezekiel and Amos and Obadiah, etc. Like, if the psalmist tells us, as 
a deer pants after a flowing stream, so pants my heart for thee. Your heart doesn't have lungs, it can't pant, so you're 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 you've now if you follow this to its logical end, you have to say that the Psalms were not true. No. Oh, one other thing about that whole Philippians passage, um, two things actually. One, yes, it tells us to think on these things. It doesn't say that each thing we think about has to be all of them at the same time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, And secondly, it it doesn't leave us to decide for ourselves how to fill Mm -hmm. in the categories. This comes Mm -hmm. after most of Scripture has been written. And we have all kinds of examples of what these things are. And I appreciate your reference to to the rape of Tamar. And then there's the incident with the first Tamar and all of that that most people won't mm-hmm. even read out loud in church. But I, I once I once made a um, a table chart of each word, and then I picked Bible verses to go with each section, and um, things like uh, praise him, all you dragons. <laughs> Anything worthy of praise? It's praiseworthy the dragons praise God. So we can talk about dragons apparently, as long as they're praising God in some fashion. And the battle scenes <laughs> of Revelation, the destruction of the great whore, the destruction of Sodom. I mean, you, you can go through and find biblical biblical examples that most modern day Christian authors wouldn't want to dwell on or use uh, because they don't fit their neo Victorian sensibilities of what is good and true and lovely and all that. Lovely. Song of Solomon. Good point. <laughs> Puritans wouldn't even let their kids read it. Um, mm-hmm. You know, there, there, there's all of that. So, For that matter, apparently neither would uh, Jewish parents. You, mm-hmm. had to, you had to reach uh, bar, mitzvah bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah you age know. in order to be allowed to read it. And, and I, I sympathize to some extent. I remember... <laughs> As a teenager in a Christian school looking across, across the classroom and seeing a bunch of really young kids with a Bible open, giggling. <laughs> it did not take me long to figure out what verses they were looking at. And I was like, yes. oh, really, brother? This, that's... But the alternative of saying, no, this is a closed book and you may not read it until you are in such and such an age and such and such a spiritual condition is not one the Bible itself imposes upon anybody. Mm-hmm. Moses, in giving instructions for how it was to be done with the Torah after his death, said every seven years you get a year to get get everybody together, men, women, and children, and you're going to read all of it out loud. That in, that includes things like commandments concerning adultery, fornication, bestiality, incest. Children were supposed to hear these things because they're going to find out. The question is from whom. And if they find out by sneaking a Bible and giggling at it, that's really not very helpful. Mm. And, and so one of the things in, in solving this problem is if people would actually read the Bible and read it out loud to their children, some of these discussions would not be happening. And we'd have a much better idea of what good literature actually is. But going back to the beginning, so God created. But as God creates, we hear him talking amongst himself. Insert doctrine of Trinity here. A father and the son and the spirit <laughs> yeah. are... Talking, let us make man from eternity. And in John 17, Christ's high, high priestly prayer is very, very good place to, to seek out these doctrines. They have loved each other and they have communicated. Titus 1 says that God promised eternal life before the world. Yeah, promised to whom? Revelation says Jesus was the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. In other and, and Acts says, Acts 15, known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. The, the persons of the Trinity told each other in detail, infinite detail, what exactly they were going to do with this creation project. That is, they told the story, but, but here's the catch. They told the story of what would actually happen. Because when God tells a story and says it's going to happen, it actually does. <laughs> <laughs> But it is a story. It is a story, as I said before. It has a plot. It has a hero, an antagonist, a protagonist, a setting, all the things, rising and falling action, um, all the things that go to good storytelling. And then he wrapped that up not only in history, but he summarized it in this book called the Bible, which itself contains summaries of the Bible itself. And mm-hmm. it, But along the way, he adorned it with, and as Brian has already pointed out, poetic devices, other literary devices, 
And he encapsulated stories within the story. We've taught, we've already spoken of the parables. And, and so I think a couple things follow. First of all, well, let's, let me make a couple distinctions for us. We've kind of done it already. We've talked about fiction. We've talked about fantasy. Let me draw a line. And I, I, I think it's pretty standard. I don't think it's particularly arbitrary. When we come to general fiction, we are saying, look, I'm going to tell you something that never happened, but I'm going to borrow the universe that exists, including its physical and chemical constancies, what we generally call natural laws. That is, gravity will function, food mm -hmm. will be digested, the sun will shine with light, all of that stuff that we call creation or nature, whatever, all that's going to all that's going to be real. It's These things be, are as we would expect to find. We would them expect in real them. Life. Yes, it's just it's like real life. It's even like real life for there there being this place called the United States, and maybe this place called Massachusetts or California, and there are going to be real people there that look like us and think more or less like us and vote more or less like us and go to psychiatrists more or less. Okay, maybe not <laughs> um, or maybe go to church, but probably not to the churches we go to, depending on who's writing the whole thing. But it's 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 a world that is very, very similar to ours, depending upon the author's worldview and its ability to deal with reality. Mm -hmm. But then into that, he introduces one or more characters that he's made up. They're not real people. They may resemble real people. They may be drawn based upon a real incident, um, based upon a true story. Yeah, based. Uh-huh, right. The only thing worse than that is inspired by true events. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, exactly. But when all is said and done, someone can read that and say, okay, well, that's that's very true to life. Although the writer, after warning us it's a made-up story, has stayed pretty close to describing God's creation as it really is. He may have made up a character. He may have made up a city, even a county, think of Faulkner, and in some cases, a nation, some little obscure nation in Africa, Wakanda, or, um, <laughs> you know, in, uh, used, to, used to be you could get away with making up little nations in, uh, in uh, Southeastern Europe or Southeast Asia, because nobody knew about those. Now they're all over the place in the, in the headlines. So we're getting to know the rest of the world and not just us. Uh, but, but you could do these things, but, but you expect the world to be like it is. And sometimes the writer may push the boundaries of probability to tell a good story but he tries to keep it believable or we, we, we having told us, he, he, there's a contract here with the reader. I'm going to tell you a, a make-believe story, but it's going to be set in a, a world that's mostly like ours. And so Dia Sex Machina is, is right out. You can't have some UFO come down and land and save the day. You can't have <laughs> um, the earth split up and some god arise up and say, you're wrong, take the thing and run off. You, you, that, at that point... He's violated our trust because that's not the kind of world we agreed to when we started reading. So that's that's fiction. Fantasy goes another step further. It says, look, I, I, what if the world were different? And there's a lot of, as Lewis called this supposal. Suppose the world were different. Suppose uh, the devil wrote letters. <laughs> Suppose Christ appeared in another world full of talking animals. Suppose that the medieval idea of uh, angels pushing the planets around was actually real. Suppose that you could take a bus ride to heaven. And then giving that supposal, still grounding his stories to some degree in our reality, he goes on and tells the story. And we understand, okay, he has supposed something that isn't true. It's wildly imaginative, could never happen. God definitely didn't do it that way. But he's told us up front, look, it's, it's in the fantasy section of the library, the bookstore, okay? See the word fantasy? That means it didn't. <laughs> it's even weirder than Pride and Prejudice, okay? <laughs> so, um, and, and so we, we either say, oh, that sounds fun. Um, I might enjoy that. Or we say, I don't like those kind of stories. And so we don't sign off on the contract. We don't read them. And, and to a certain degree, that's our choice. We can read, we can not read. Uh, now, the question becomes is how far can you legitimately push this fantasy thing? Because aren't you rewriting God's world? Well, but fiction rewrites God's world. Mm -hmm. And some of it rewrites it worse than fantasy does because here's the thing. Whether you're telling fiction in the narrow sense or fantasy, who is God? Mm -hmm. um, the, when you read 1984, Brave New World, is God there? You, you kind of feel that he is because the world still operates in terms of a regularity and with the logic 
that presupposes the creator God. But when you look at the future of the planet as they describe it, you begin to wonder whether or not this actually is God's world. The people are certainly living as though he's not there. Yeah, they don't. They obviously don't believe in him, and, and we're given the impression that the world is going in a direction that is not in harmony with the gospel and with the what the Bible says about Earth's future. So there's that. Um, fiction can make statements, indirect statements about the reality of God, the um, normativeness of His law. There are books where adultery and fornication are presented as normal ways of life, and people do it in the book, and nothing really bad happens, and there's no hint that everything, anything will happen, and nor is there any hint that, that we should frown upon this. It's just part of the fun of the story. That's not God's universe. That's not God's morality. Uh, it's one thing to say, yes, these people live like this, but to somehow in the narration to communicate that, and even the Bible does this occasionally, but the thing that David did displeased the Lord. <laughs> it, it is possible for the narrator to make it very clear, yeah, these people are living like there's no God. They're wrong. <laughs> um, and part of this can be done by leaving questions. Yeah. I mean, my ninth graders just got done reading The Scarlet Letter. Mm. Uh, by Nathaniel Hawthorne. And of course, Nathaniel Hawthorne makes no statement about what God thinks about any of this business. Um, I don't think Nathan Nathaniel Hawthorne particularly cared what God thought about the business. But part of his function as the storyteller is just raising the question of who, if anyone, was right? Yeah. What could have been done differently? And that is a worthwhile question to think about. And I think as Christians, we have more reason to yeah. have confidence in some of the answers we might come okay. to. And even though, and, and actually Scarlet Letter arguably is fantasy literature to some degree mm -hmm. as well. <laughs> yeah, those Puritans don't sound like actual <laughs> Puritans at all. <laughs> and, and, yeah, and fictional. But, you know, the, the way you phrased it, um, who was right? That's a moral question. Mm -hmm. Hawthorne is struggling with morality, which is to say he's wrestling with God. He may mm -hmm. want to say, I don't believe in this God, but why do you keep asking questions that only make sense in his universe? Right. If there is no creator God, then there is no right and wrong, and your question is silly. And this was just an, uh, an exercise in telling us random things that happen in this obscure corner of the world in this, in this time frame. And it may interest us, it may not, but why should we pass judgments and by what standard and why would there be a standard and why are we judging anyway and what is it does it does the fact that we're inclined to make judgments say anything about us no of course not because there's no god so when when we're writing the question of god is inescapable we may bury it in the background we may not want to look at it uh, in truly pagan cultures they have their own gods and they will write in terms of them in the west it's kind of hard to get away from our history, and it's kind of hard to get away from the fact that once upon a time, most people believed the God of the Bible was real. And so even in denying that, they're denying that. They're acknowledging that somebody someplace probably believes in this God, and it makes us really angry that they do, and we're going to say something nasty to tick them off <laughs> or to show them how superior we are, because we don't think that way, even though we keep talking about God implicitly, sometimes more than Christians do, because we're constantly <laughs> yeah. bringing up moral issues in Christians. Often don't. <laughs> you don't think that deeply sometimes. Anyway, let's look at the story of Jotham. Let me let me read it and then see what you think. So we know that um, Abimelech, Gideon's son by his concubine, has killed all of uh, Gideon's sons except this one youngest. Uh, and the men of Shechem are anointing him to be king. And uh, Jotham climbs a mountain, Mount Gerizim, and yells down, to tell them this. The trees went forth on a time to anoint a king over them. They said unto the olive tree, Reign thou over us. But the olive tree said unto them, Should I leave my fatness, wherewith by me they honor God and man, and go to be promoted over the trees? And the tree said to the fig tree, Come thou and reign over us. But the fig tree said unto them, Should I forsake my sweetness and my good fruit, and go to be promoted over the trees? Then to the trees into the vine, Come thou and reign over us. And the vine said unto them, Should I leave my wine, which cheereth God and man? Oh, wait, and, we, we were supposed to drink wine? 
Apparently, yeah, because it, mm-hmm. it cheers us, just like it cheers God. <laughs> Yikes. Yeah. And go to be promoted over the sea. Obviously, this is a bad story. Um, and go to be promoted over the trees. Then said all the trees unto the bramble, come thou and reign over us. And the bramble said unto the trees, if in truth you anoint me king over you, then come and put your trust in my shadow. Bramble shadows are real close to the ground. <laughs> you really have to humble yourself to get into a bramble shadow. And and uh, if not, let the fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon, the really big trees. And the point he makes, he explains is, if you've done well and honored Gideon and his household, cool. But if you haven't, then may you and your king burn, burn each other to pieces because you are bramble men. You are worthless. You're non-productive. You went and found the lousiest, most unproductive jerk there is, mass murderer, to make him your king. You're going to get exactly what you deserve from this. And then Jotham runs off. Now, we're not told that um, Jotham was inspired by God. Uh, it is placed in scripture, but that again does not mean that it is that God approves of it all. But we are told at the end of all of this, when Abimelech finally dies, God rendered the wickedness of Abimelech, which he did unto his father in slaying his 70 brothers, and all the evil of all the men of Shechem did God render upon their heads, and upon them came the curse of Jotham, the son of Jeroboam, Gideon. Hmm. And so that sure sounds like God honored his story. Mm-hmm. And and that brings us immediately to some to some observations, which I'd like you to, to pick at, uh, if you don't mind. What do you see in the story that goes beyond simple fiction? As far as... What's, fanta- know, what's fantastic? What's fantastic about it? And, and the trees are talking, first of all. Yeah, um, you, th- you think they're ants or something. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and no, J.R.R. Tolkien invented those. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They're yeah. also establishing government. <laughs> they are establishing... They're engaging in political activity. They're... They're covenanting to create a monarchy, constitutional monarchy. And, yeah, monarchy. They, they don't even want to be an anarchist syndicalist commune. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what were they thinking there? I don't know. You have the trees expressing their will to do their jobs. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's like you going out into your yard and seeing a dandelion, and the dandelion says, Oh, yes, I'm so happy to be growing here. Like, the, no, that's <laughs> that's the stuff of. Children's stories, the anthropomorphic personification of plants. Yeah. And yet God takes this story, the story of talking trees, and honors it and says that he honored it. He he took this up, and which was a curse against these people, and God himself fulfilled it and made clear that he did fulfill it. Not just It wasn't just a coincidence. Well, yeah, Jotham said this, but I was going to do it anyway. There's no, there's no hint of that. The Jotham, that's, go ahead. That's another squishy thing about the line between history and fiction and fantasy is that there's a lot in this world that sounds like it shouldn't be real. Mm-hmm. You know, you read about, I don't know, depending on your sources, Rasputin, uh-huh. and uh, some strange, bizarre things happened around the royal family of <laughs> Russia. Um, you know, was that witchcraft? Mm-hmm. Is witchcraft necessarily fantasy? Because yeah. we know that there is such a thing as witchcraft. We know right. that there have been demons at work in the world. That doesn't make it unlike the world in which we live. And and I think there's an interesting tangent that I don't want to pursue very far, but I do note that a lot of early Christian fantasy in the 19, say, 70s and 80s went straight for demonism. It wasn't, oh, here are Martians or Venusians or talking lions. It was, here's somebody possessed by demons and the Christians have to battle them for the life of the world or their community or whatever. Like, okay, that was rather direct. <laughs> and and you you I'm sure you think you're doing some good and maybe you are. But who which, which one is more likely to stir interest in demonology and witchcraft? the one that has talking lions or the one that actually shows you 
sorcer real sorcerers or our conception of what a real sorcerer would be at work with real <laughs> the demons. The 1970s conception of what a sorcerer would be. Yeah, exactly. Would be like. And a 1970s conception of what demons actually do. A lot of those lines, interestingly, you should mention, I've been rereading a couple of my books on UFOs. And one of them is written by two Christian authors who, for whom I have a fair amount of respect. Um, I think they uh, are a little gullible at places, but I think by and large, they, they understand that a lot of what passes for UFO activity is simply demonic um, hysteria. Demons mm -hmm. put things into people's minds as they have done for centuries. And that what people think they saw, they didn't see, although demons truly can take on physical form and manifest energy patterns. And so this is just this 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 book has just been one long really you don't say wow <laughs> um, that's scary you know there's it's a roll out one story after another with the constant refrain of and as if that wasn't far enough <laughs> listen to this one uh, and, and well they acknowledge that some of their um, some of their accounts may be open to criticism or or may flat out be lies that they have tons and tons of this kind of stuff. And so you you do begin asking, no, wait, if what they're saying, they're claiming it's historically and scientifically true in the sense that people in some cases have seen things where there are multiple witnesses who saw the same thing and can verify. In other cases, people at least have a consistent story that they seem to believe and often remember under hypnosis, which is self-suspicious. <laughs> uh, but, you know, there's the, these are psychiatrists drawing out these stories. So in that sense, it's sort of scientific. Um, <laughs> Depending on the psychiatrist. Yeah, exactly. So what, you know, what this is, the, honestly, the stories they tell are far more frightening than, say, uh, the Goblin and Curdy or Three Little Bears. <laughs> <laughs> Goldilocks. Uh, Goldilocks and Three Bears. Yeah, I mean, there, there, there you got anthropomorphic bears. That's fantasy. I don't think anyone fell, ever fell into demonism from that. <laughs> but reading sci the, the other book I read was by secular scientists who are absolutely convinced that UFOs are real things. That is, that they represent extraterrestrial civilization. Odds, are, but the thing, the funny thing is that they are more gullible than the Christian authors because they're, it, it starts out okay, lights in the sky, okay, something was here, okay, the environment's been physically altered. They end up with the most ridiculous stories. That, this sounds like a bad dream because it's probably what it was. And it may have been demon induced, but it, this did not happen. And the Christian authors can say, yeah, it didn't happen. But people sincerely believe it did because demons are messing with their minds. Mm -hmm. And so the, this whole question of what's, what does realism mean is a good question. Uh, to what degree do realistic stories? I, I wrote a. Um, I ghost wrote a uh, short booklet for junior high students on William Wallace. And there is a point where he goes into a castle and the weirdest things happen to him. And I wrote it because the only sources we have say, this is what happened. And I qualified it a little bit, but this is what the, the few historical sources that we have agree on, that some really weird things happened to him in this castle. So what do you do with that? Well, you qualify it a little and say, <laughs> The story, the story writers, the poets say that, yeah. and then you tell what happened. Is that history or is that fantasy? I don't know, because again, in terms of what I said up front, we don't, we're not omniscient. Mm -hmm. And in terms of what you're saying, yeah, witchcraft, demonism, real thing. Mm -hmm. So simply avoiding fantasy does not avoid having books about demons, nor does it avoid the very real possibility of those very books about demons written realistically and even by Christian authors might pull people in to a fascination with this stuff. Mm -hmm. There is a danger there. Yeah. And I kind of live along the borderline of that sometimes of, yeah, I'm not going over that line because this is, hell is on the other side in the most literal sense. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, my friends, don't go over there. That's not, that's not a good place to be. But this story yes. isn't like that. These are talking trees. It's charming. It's adorable. <laughs> it's... Yeah, the trees want to get involved in politics. And so all of the trees in Matt, it doesn't, I, I was looking to see if it says they actually move. I don't think it does. I think they just talk. They just keep saying. They say this, they say this. Um, well, it's charming and lovely and, and sweet until you get the threat of burning yeah. them all to death. <laughs> yeah, until the end. 
Uh, mm -hmm. But along the way, the trees, they, they mention God. In fact, they mention God twice. Uh, by speaking of uh, oil, by me they honor God and man. Wine cheers the heart of God and man. So it is possible to tell not only a fictional story, but a fantasy story set in what we might think of as a different universe, one in which trees actually talk and engage in politics, and mention the true God, the God of the Bible, and God isn't offended. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we should understand that he would be more offended if we left him out. <laughs> Because do we really want to go around imagining universes where God's locked out? Mm. I, I think that is horrific beyond imagination mm. and very lonely. Are we going to create a world that we go into and leave our best friend, our Savior, and our God outside? And when we say God, it cannot be a God later to be named. It cannot be a generic God. It cannot be the God of, deistic, of therapeutic uh, deism. It has to be the God of the Bible. It has to be the Trinitarian God, because that he's the only God there is. And when he comes, he brings with him all of his attributes, all of his holiness, justice, love, and all that. And so this universe that we've moved into must, in some measure, actually in quite a great measure, reflect the morality of Scripture. And that's where the dangers start lying. You go into Narnia or you go into Middle Earth, and you're, you're in a world you know because God is God, and... Uh, right is right and wrong is wrong. There's a great line from uh, from Aragorn in uh, Lord of the Rings. Aragorn. Ar I read it and it says Aragorn. I will not I know. change I that, caught that to typo Aragorn. in your article too. Wow. <laughs> I do that a lot out loud, but I didn't think I did it in print. Aragorn is a region in Spain. <laughs> I know what it is. All right. And yet every time I get there, I have to stop and ask myself which it is. Aragorn <laughs> says to the writers of Rohan, Good and ill have not changed since yesterday, nor are they one thing among the elves and dwarves and another among men. It is a man's part to discern them as much in the golden wood as in his own house. And maybe Tolkien was being a little preachy there, but it, it's certainly to the point. <laughs> because on this, Middle Earth stands or falls. If good is not universal, then what's the deal with Sauron? Why are we bothering him? He's just doing his own thing. And if he hasn't actually hurt me, so I have to hit him back, unless I'm just doing preemptive, well, he might hit me someday, so I'm going to hit him first. That's pragmatic. That's not ethics. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm going to call him evil, then that means I've got some kind of universal standard that he, as a fallen angel, is subject to the same way I, as a man, am, the same way the elves and the dwarves are. All of these creatures are bound by common morality, just as in the real world, angels, devils, and humans are all bound by common morality. But then how can you have Gandalf, a wizard, as a good guy? Is that your devil's advocate voice? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> Sorry, my voices are not distinct. No one can tell my sarcastic voice from my regular voice. It's a problem. Um, the, the choice of the word wizard is questionable, although it comes from... A, a, the English word comes from a word that means wise. Uh, but the biblical word has other roots. Uh, if you read enough and read far enough, you will find out that Gandalf is not a man. He is, in fact, a minor angel come in seeming flesh to contest the power of Sauron. He has been sent by the other angels and ultimately by God, by Iluvatar himself, to uh, challenge the devil, as it were. And so what he does, he does not do by spells or by magic. He does by the same way an angel does it, by being an angel. Mm -hmm. uh, but he is on, he's on a leash as to how much he can do. He can encourage people to stand up to the devil, to Sauron, the enemy. But he's not allowed to go at him directly and match his power with his power. Uh, and then you have to read a lot and in between the lines of places and read the um, appendices and maybe some of the Silmarillion to get all of that. But that's what's going on. He's he's not that kind of sorcerer. There's there's an amusing incident in La Florian where uh, the elves are presenting the, the company of the ring with gifts, and among them are elven cloaks. And one of the younger hobbits, maybe Pippin, I don't remember, says to the elves, "Are these magic?" <laughs> and the elf says, "I don't know what that means." <laughs> Their elven work, certainly, and a very high quality. Uh, in other words, people with special skills can make special things, the way Stradivarius can make 
a violin that is unmatched by other violins. Uh, or uh, Barbara Streisand can sing a song that will bring lots of liberals to give hundreds of thousands of dollars to the right <laughs> liberal cause, you know. Uh, so Lewis is not seeing these characters as magic users, as something like uh, Dungeons and Dragons would advocate or, or other kinds of, of fantasy literature. There is no magic pool from which they pour. There are no demons they consult with. They are who they are, and as who they are, they make stuff. Gandalf is different in that he's an angel, and as an angel, he has his own nature and his power to, to alter realities to some extent, given him directly by God, but also he has a job description from God that, that limits what he's allowed to do. So there's all of that. Um, Tolkien does make reference to God. Of course, Lewis does, uh, both in his space trilogy in uh, The Great Divorce and in uh, the Narnia series. Um, even in Till We Have Faces, and that's one that, let me just go off on this tangent. I used to wonder about um, Till We Have Faces because I assumed that the gods that the, the queen was encountering were the Greek gods. And so I thought that Lewis was using the Greek gods as a symbol for the true God. And that seemed awkward and difficult at best until I finally read what Lewis actually said. He said, no, this is the true God. It's just that she's getting there basically by natural theology and by revelation beyond scripture. I think I like the other better. Thank you very much. I, mean, <laughs> I feel like I'm in the last book of Narnia where people get into heaven because they didn't worship a bad God in a bad way. <laughs> um, no, that's okay. But, you know, uh, Paul on a couple of occasions does offer us a very brief supposal. If they had known God's wisdom, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. That's an entire completely different conception of the universe. And Paul stops there. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, I forget the other one. There's another point where Paul, oh, if Christ be not risen from the dead, well, then our faith is vain where it's all lost. And he stops there. He doesn't tell a whole novel in which Christ did not really rise from the dead, in which case he wasn't really God. He, he, he drops it off as a supposal to show us that's a dead end. And then he comes back to biblical reality. So the use of universes where the true God does not exist there may be some, but they are extremely limited and short-lived and are not places Christians should play. And so more than the question of, did this really happen or could it have really happened, is in this story, who are you hanging out with? Who's the ultimate personality that dominates this? Is it God hmm. or is it something else? Uh, sometimes we ask the wrong question. The Harry Potter series I didn't let my girls read it until they were in their teens or so. And it had nothing to do with the magic. Or the, <laughs> Quote, unquote, magic. Yeah, or the badly mangled Latin mm -hmm. that they used. It had everything to do with Harry. He was a punk. Mm -hmm. He was a liar. He had no respect for authority. And I didn't want my girls hanging out with somebody like that for book after book after book. Now, in the end, he grows up. But... Not all children have the maturity to spend however many books there are with a punk and not be affected by that. We are affected by the company we keep. Mm -hmm. And if you can come into a universe where God isn't, that's not a safe place to be. So even when we're telling stories of uh, floating isles and talking trees of silver ships that sail the stars and all that, God had better be there. It better be God's universe. Right and wrong had better be the same for dwarves and elves and talking trees, or we're in a lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have maybe one last tangent to go off on, but mm -hmm. the the supposing that one can identify truth versus fiction is itself a very dubious claim which we touched on a little bit, but it reminded me of Jordan Peterson. Saying, <laughs> of course it did. There of course it did. Everything <laughs> reminds me of Jordan Peterson. But one of the things he says is tell the truth or at least don't lie. Yeah. And that's because you don't know what it means to tell the truth. You're mm. not ready to tell the truth. What you can do is identify the lies and stop telling them. Yes. <laughs> um, which, you know, as... Certainly when he penned those words, he was not a Christian. As far as we know, currently, he is not a Christian. Um, I'm, I'm holding out for it. Um, 
but I think as Christians, there's something to be learned from that as well, that to be a truth teller is not a simple thing. No, it's um, not. We have the word of God, and that's a fair sight more than Jordan Peterson as a pagan has. Yeah. And we have his assurance that we can understand it, that he made us to understand it, mm. that he gave us that faculty. Mm. But to say that we know what the truth is, yeah. it's better to start with we know who the truth is. Yeah. Exactly. You don't know that you're not ready for the truth, which actually brings me back to Till We Have Faces, because the first three-fourths of the book is told from the queen's point of view, the older sister and the psyche legend. And she thinks, or she thinks she thinks, that her account of what has happened is honest and true, and the gods have been out to get her. They've been unfair. They've been unjust. They have not behaved themselves like gods. And she basically throws down the gauntlet and says, how dare you justify yourselves? Yeah, this whole book is her case against the gods. It's, yeah, her whole case against the gods. But in the end, she opens up the book and writes the final chapter, which basically says, I misunderstood everything. Why do the gods not talk to us face to face? It's because we have no faces. We don't know the truth ourselves. We lie to ourselves about what things mm. are and how the world works. And who we are in it. And until we finally, as Van Til would call it, reach epistemological self-consciousness. <laughs> right. <laughs> why would God bother trying to answer us when we are living in lies? So, yeah, this idea of truth-telling is a lot bigger. And this maybe is just, uh, something we, sh we can pursue at another time. Truth-telling is harder than you think. It's not just a matter of reciting facts. Um, there's a story of the uh, ship's captain who had a first mate he didn't like. And so every so often in his uh, journal, which was sent on to the home company, he would write, the first mate is not drunk today. <laughs> every two or three or four days, the first mate's not drunk today. The truth, of true course, statement. Was he, the true statement. The truth was he never got drunk. He didn't drink. But as uh, having told the truth like that the way he did, eventually the company said, why don't you fire this guy? Go ahead and get rid of him. Okay. <laughs> truth telling is harder than you think. Mm -hmm. Well, shall we close out with some recommendations? Yeah, I and mean, you get to go first. Oh, I nominate Brian to go first. <laughs> All right, Brian. Okay. Um, then in that case, I will uh, definitely steal the recommendation of uh, Tolkien's On Fairy Stories. Mm -hmm. um, and then I will also double up on that with recommending a proper fiction book, which is That Hideous Strength mm -hmm. by C.S. Lewis. As I was Isn't listening, that a fairy tale for grownups? Yes, it, it is. is. <laughs> and I was, uh, the main reason is because I was thinking of it in, in terms of, you know, life. And also mm -hmm. the fact that I was listening to uh, the album Dichotomy by Becoming mm -hmm. the Archetype, which is based so on the novel. Yes. And yes, it was it was a rock out in the shower kind of <laughs> listening party, basically. Uh, you have so to send those are links to the stuff. I don't know oh, this music. It would not be your jam. I can tell and you. This that. would not be your jam. <laughs> okay. We definitely both know old. that. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe Saint, um, Saint Anne's lullaby would be. But oh that's yeah. It. Well, that's everybody's jam. It's lovely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Dichotomy by Becoming the Archetype is a Christian death metal album based on <laughs> that idea of strength. Okay. Well, it's just very fitting at times with the screaming. You know. Yeah. 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 I, I I don't listen to a lot of screaming. But I actually I do enjoy that era of becoming the archetype because I can understand this the one words. is like the ex <laughs> it's the exception as well for me. Like mm -hmm. I I don't think I've ever enjoyed any other kind of band. Well, actually, that's not true. Wolves at the Gate has a couple songs that are mm -hmm. like that, but mm -hmm. they're, um, really they're kind of in the same vein. Anyway, we're getting off on a tangent. On a tangent. <laughs> so that, those are my recommendations on fairy stories. And now then, we're gonna uh, have to have. A whole nother episode on why it's okay for Christians to listen to death metal. Yeah, <laughs> yes, because somebody's going to uh, take offense at it. <laughs> mm. Oh. Let me, Bye. My Emily has yeah. waved. We're, we're waving at the other Emily. <laughs> uh, let me do mine just to get it out of the way. Okay. Some friends of ours have started a podcast of their own. This is oh, yeah. Josiah and David Farshman. Um, they're doing a podcast about how to read literature, and it is appropriately called How Shall We Then Read? <laughs> Uh, and they're beginning with Lord of the Rings. And some of the things we talked about will show up there as well. So check them out. They've only got one out so far because life is busy. Mm -hmm. But there'll be more coming. 
And I think uh, if you enjoyed any of what we were talking about, uh, David and Josiah, I think we'll draw it out in much more detail, particularly with reference to Tolkien and what he was trying to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, David Freshman appeared on this podcast as a guest on their Science and Wonder episode. So check that episode out and check his podcast out for sure. Um, I'm going to recommend an anime. Um, this has been my... My brain is so tired, I need it to turn off, but I'm not ready to commit to going to sleep yet. <laughs> um, it's it's called Haikyuu, and it's about a volleyball tournament. And I have a friend who's very into anime, but she's very into older anime and like hmm. serious things. Like Neon Genesis Evangelion is like her favorite thing in the world, which is incomprehensible because it's <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. But slice of life, normal, wholesome stories are not usually the typical thing that she goes for, except for this time. And she's like, Emily, you you really need to watch this because it's so wholesome. (laughs) (laughs) And she's so right. Um, You just, I mean, yes, it's a sports show. So it's like, are they going to win? Are they going to lose? That's about the extent of the stakes. But the character growth and the leadership growth, and they really have this great... Um, older student who's a fantastic leader, but also a priest type character, mm-hmm. um, as opposed to the prophet or king, which as a person who tends toward priestliness in personality myself, I appreciate because there are not a lot of really good priest leaders. Um, we should do an episode about prophet, priest, king as we should. personalities and roles and the image of God and all that. Mm. But yeah, that's my my uh, recommendation. It'll be in the show notes when we get Eventually. show notes to happen again. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever that is. Yeah. That's all we have for today. <laughs> Say goodnight, Emily. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much for listening. We appreciate you tuning in. Uh, let us know what you think. Um, have we missed the strongest argument in the world against Christians reading fiction and fantasy? Let us know. Haltingtowardsion at gmail.com is our email address. You can also check us out on Facebook, on YouTube, on Rumble, on any other podcast catcher. Um, you can support us financially if you'd like. Um, our website is anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion. Thank you to those who support us financially. We really appreciate you keeping the show rolling, giving us some good editing software. It helps us out tremendously. Thank you once again for listening. See you next week. <laughs>